Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel, nice to see you again. So today's video is going to be a bit of a mishmash, we're going to have a look at the discus and the breeding plans uh, down in the fish room in a second. But I also wanted to talk about an idea that was given to me by one of my subscribers, and someone that I'm subscribed to as well actually. I will put a link in the description, it's Colin Barsby, he's got a video that talks about what makes a, a good tank mate for discus. Uh, and as I'm a keen discus enthusiast, um, I had already seen it before, like I say, but yeah, it, it's an interesting topic and something that you'll often hear um, people arguing about on the internet is about what kind of fish you should keep with other fish and for what reasons. Um, certainly with discus, a lot of the discussions focus around the, the compatibility of a, another fish, but as well as that, you have to look at what are the requirements of these different fish. So. Um, with discus often we'll talk about, well there's, there's the set standard of what are acceptable fish to live alongside them and that's things like it might be your bristlenose plecos, your larger tetras, your uh, corridoras, the ones that... your stairby corridoras that can tolerate the heat a bit better uh, and various connotations in between. You'll have one camp of people that'll say it's perfectly fine to keep angelfish with discus and you'll have another camp of people that'll say it's terrible to keep angelfish from discus. But I wanted to talk a little bit about why you choose what fish it is to keep with your discus. Colin's video, he's talking to a friend of his, a professor, a discus breeder, whatever it may be, uh, but it focuses on using goldfish as a potential companion fish for your discus. and. I urge you to go and watch the video and then you won't listen to me repeat myself, but basically the expectation is people go goldfish, that's a cold water fish surely. Um, but the reason that I had seen this video before and I wasn't necessarily surprised about it is when I first got into discus years and years and years ago, um, I noticed that a few people did this. One person who was on a lot of the forums I was on, posting a lot of pictures and videos and things, uh, I noticed that he kept a raukin or raukin never sure how you pronounce that and um, a couple of his tanks and I made that initial impression of aren't they cold water fish why why do you do that and through chatting to him um, realized that maybe it's not necessarily true and while the fish can tolerate cold water um, it's not necessarily it's a requirement for the fish to have cold water um, and there might actually be some really good reasons to keep that with it but the long and the short of it was that fish, or several of those goldfish he had were over 20 years old and that's a really good innings for a, a, a goldfish, especially if you're keeping it in unoptimized conditions as some might say. Um, so, but the goldfish, especially the fancy types, they're very slow moving, they're not going to be darting around the tank scaring your fish. The point Colin's video tries to make is the goldfish have a really long intestinal tract so they will actually perform a clean-up crew function uh, and scoop up some of the discus poop and reprocess it so as you're not getting that high bio load coming straight out the high uh, protein heavy load coming straight out of the discus because they have a comparatively short intestinal tract and they talk about also using them as uh, a canary if you like the canary in the coal mine thing where although discus do normally veer towards low pH um, you don't want it going too low and then if, if you get really down to below 5 that's when your goldfish is going to start struggling. So not always great things for the goldfish but they are good reasons to look after your discus with. But I like to pick fish, or the way that I approach it is I like to pick things that I like. So the reason I don't keep goldfish in with any of my discus tanks is it just doesn't look right to me or the aesthetic doesn't quite sit right. I'd happily keep them in some of my bare bottom tanks uh, if I was growing out a load of discus, I'd probably quite happily keep in a goldfish in with them at the moment, but my display tanks are they're, they're more for me to enjoy the aesthetics of it, and it, if I saw a goldfish in there, it just kind of triggers my brain a little bit and goes, that doesn't quite look right, so that's not why I'm doing it. So the reasons I would look to pick some fish is the, the, the idea of a dither fish is a really good one. Sometimes um, your discus can be quite shy and timid and the dither fish is there to be a smaller fish that the big fish sees out swimming around happily not getting eaten or getting attacked so they feel a bit more confident than they can come out um, and I have seen that work, I have had discus before in the past where they've always been hiding, adding a bunch of small tetras 
um, not too small or they'll just be lunch but add in a bunch of tetras and really almost immediately the discus will be all oh, right everything's fine i'm not going to get chomped on here and they'll be out and they'll be swimming around and um, so that's a really good one things that do jobs so the goldfish again that could be one that could be doing jobs but your your other fish are doing jobs as well you might have corridors to keep the substrate clean they're up hoovering up the the food there, you might have your bristlenose plecos working on your algae or any other number of fish doing things like that. But I would always pick something that's interesting and nice and or just really something that appeals to you so as you've got another thing to look at in your tank. It's really about knowing which ones to avoid. So if something isn't compatible at all, and yes, that could be subjective, that could be an argument on the internet as to whether or not something is truly compatible. Um, but I think it's worth considering. Um, by all means try things but don't just if you only have one tank don't go and buy a fish that might be compatible then you can't take it out and compatibility can be to do with aggression it can be to do with water conditions and parameters and things like that and it's something you really need to keep an eye on if you're not sure if it's not something that's tried and tested by all means try and test it but not to the point of killing the fish if that makes sense and as well as compatibility is compatibility with your your discus or whatever fish it is you're talking about discus particularly um, they're often not aggressive eaters um, although most of mine are at the moment but you don't want something that's a more aggressive eater than the discus therefore every time you put the food in the other fish gets it and then your fish don't get anything so I just thought that was an interesting topic. Please go and check out Colin's video. Let me know what you think in the comments. Let me know what kind of fish you're keeping with your discus or if you've got some kind of controversial tank mates that are living together happily. Let me know what they are. It's always interesting to find out. I do like to kind of push the boundaries myself, um, but it's interesting to get feedback from other people as well. So with that said, let's go downstairs and we'll do a bit of water testing and see if we've got any action down in the discus breeding tank. Before we go into the fish room, I just thought I'd give you a little update. I'm quite proud of this. We had a massive flood here the other day. Uh, I know regular subscribers will know that I quite like to overflow my tanks and cause floods. It's the first ever flood we've had. It wasn't my fault. The wife put a nail through a pipe in the wall. <laughs> I'm just I'm just recording this for posterity, so I can always point at this video every time I flood the, the living room upstairs. Anyway, let's go in. We've got all my test kits lined up, well some of my test kits lined up, I've got a few different types, we've got the API master test kit, I've got the JBL test, I've got a few individual tests for KH and GH, I've got my PH pen and my TDS pen, uh, I'm just going to give them all a quick measure of the tank down here, uh, again more just to compare and contrast what the different test kits are reading because the whole thing that's quite interesting. But I must stress that this isn't necessarily me saying these are the optimal conditions to breed your discus in. These are the conditions I am breeding my discus in, so they will not be optimal. But with that said, I have bred hundreds of discus in this exact water. I've not changed the system in any way, shape or form. Um, what you would normally want to do if you were trying to get the optimal conditions is you would probably use RO water. Um, and mix that in with your tap water or remineralize it with your mineralization product of your choice um, but I'm not really into mass producing the fish and um, as I said in the last video I know these particular fish are probably going to give me a lot of brown fish so I don't really want loads of them it's just a little side project to keep me going in this in these trying times as they say so anyway I'll go on with that I won't bore you with that but we'll come back and we'll have a look at the discussions so results are back in and um, I'll put up here somewhere the results from the JBL test talk you through that and um, largely the same except for the following exceptions the nitrate test kit again on the JBL seems higher than the API kit on API it measured around five maybe and um, which is more what I expect because the, the amount of water that's getting changed in there it's on a constant water change there I wouldn't expect to have a lot of nitrate there Nitrite is measuring zero on the other test kits, whereas it's 0.25 on this. But I've never managed to get a JBL test that tells me I've got zero nitrite. Um, total hardness and carbonate hardness, GH and KH, they stay the same. pH value, it says here, less than six. And both the API kit and my pH pen tell me it is six. Um, chlorine, chlorine and carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide. So they measure the same ammonia zero on the API test. Um, 
kind of what I expected. The other one is TDS. TDS on the TDS pen measured 110. Um, I'm sure you all know that TDS is total dissolved solids. It doesn't tell you what those solids are, it just tells you that there are some. So the only really safe measurement of TDS is zero, because if you have one and it's something really nasty, then that could be quite bad. But it's always been around 100 to 150 whenever I've bred discs before, and I've got a fairly good hatch rate. Because um, what you want is, you want that kind of Goldilocks element where it's not something that's too high or too low in any value because you'll get problems either way. Um, so I'm fairly happy with those numbers. I think that'll be fine. I'm sure they could be better and there are things I could do to change my water, but I'm not going to attempt them yet. I'm going to have a couple of cycles of letting them lay eggs, seeing what happens before I start to intervene. So we'll leave it there for now. If you want to keep up with what's going on, by all means, click that subscribe button, ding the bell, make sure you don't miss any of the future uh, releases. And for there, I think we'll call it quits there. Hopefully that's of some use to everyone. Again, I'm not trying to say these are the optimal conditions you want to breed discus. These are just the conditions I'm currently got. So thanks very much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.